Hi, my name's Sophie. I'm Head of Business Development and Marketing here at Procter & Stevenson, and today we're filming the Marketing Masterclass. We'll be talking to Rohini Kars, who's Communications Manager for historical Southwest charity Running Me Trust. She'll be discussing all things marketing within the third sector and providing insight and a little bit about her inspirations to other charities across the UK. Thank you so much, Rohini, for joining us today. If it's okay with you, just before we get started, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, tell us a little bit about your role and then a little bit about the Running Me Trust as an organisation. Thanks so much, Sophie, and um, nice to see you again as well. Um, my name is Rohini Kosh, and I'm the Communications Manager at the Running Me Trust. Uh, so my role involves basically all elements of communications both, well, yeah, mainly externally. Um, so that includes all our social media work, all our work on our website, anything public facing, and also all the media work that we do with um, print and online media um, and kind of broadcast and things like that. So it's a very, um, I think where most people would probably have quite a few people or even departments on it. We're a really small team, so we kind of have to, to pitch in what we can to be able to do. Um, quite a broad range of work um, and that is all at the Running Me Trust which is the UK's leading independent race equality think tank so in English terms we um, we produce research on all matters to do with race and racial inequality in the UK um, and we've been around since 1968 doing that and we use our work to influence policy and to drive change to see a, a world in which or a Britain at least in which um, yeah, everyone can lead a fulfilling life and, and race, racial injustice is eradicated. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. The, you know, Running Me Trust is an incredibly inspirational organisation. And like many um, sort of charities and, and third sector organisations, um, you have to take on a lot of those responsibilities kind of within a smaller team. So it's, it's, you're already facing a bit of an uphill battle because you're, you're kind of battling for something to make sure that your message is out there, um, that it's reaching the right people um, and that it's you know, changing the way that we do things as well. I know that Running Meet has had a massive political impact um, with so many different uh, laws and regulations and continues to do so today. So it's incredible that you managed to do so much um, with, with such a small team and, and so much of it falls on your shoulders as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really brilliant to be able to speak to you today. Um, kind of on that note, I guess, um, you know, like we said, Running Mead is an incredible organisation. It has such a, an important standing within the community. I think particularly within the current political climate, I think that's fair for me to say. Um, what are the types of marketing challenges that you kind of face on a day-to-day -day basis? That's quite a big question because we face, as you just mentioned, so many different types. So I think the main one, um, which I think is across the charity sector and across the third sector, is resource and budget and where big corporate companies would have, you know, huge departments and different teams and a huge pot of money to do, um, you know, really like amazing videos or all these kinds of things. We don't have that necessarily. Um, so, you know, not to say that we're completely broke, but there's, there's those kinds of um, resource elements which are always a challenge I think in, in any charity sector whether that's in the communication marketing or um, other strands um, and then I think for running me specifically you kind of hinted that the political landscape is quite difficult at the moment and I think we're at a really interesting time um, and a really pivotal time I think in Britain um, with its kind of reckoning with race and you know following Covid where we saw that I think minority people were massively disproportionately impacted um, and also with that, and at kind of the same time, the resurgence or the not resurgence, but um, interest that grew in Black Lives Matter uh, following the death or the murder of George Floyd, but also, you know, thinking about actually in Britain, what's our problem with race? What, what's actually going on with institutional racism in Britain? Um, and that led to a huge open conversation that I think for the first time in many, many years really touched people that probably aren't affected by race and racism personally. Um, and then on the counter side of that, we've now got the so-called war on woke, right? So it's a very polarised um, environment where I think actually the majority of British people and the majority of businesses and teachers and schools, you know, everyone I think is on side with um, challenging race. But there is a really small quarter that make that, making that kind of shift to tackling structural racism quite difficult, which is, um, you know, the racism that we see not directly say between me and you but not that there is but um with you know the the institutions that you live in or study in or work in you know the way that the police um operates the way that schools teach certain subjects um 
the way that the workplaces handle um, not just racial discrimination, but the kind of discrepancies that employees might have, um, whether or not that's intentional or not. But we know that, for example, ethnic minority women have severe barriers to um, career progression and all those kinds of things don't necessarily fall on the shoulder of one person. So what we do find is that opening the conversation and making it easy to kind of talk about structural racism in a productive and positive way, not that it's a positive thing, but countering it in a positive way is where we find the kind of sticking point um, with the current kind of political climate. I would say that's that's a big challenge for us is moving the conversation beyond just direct racial discrimination that I think everybody agrees is wrong to a more structural conversation. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think, um, at least, you know, from my sort of very limited understanding in comparison to yourself, um, yeah, we've seen kind of almost like you said, two polarizing conversations start. You've got the, you know, people being more um, kind of aware than ever of things like police brutality and, and, and you know, kind of historical biases and sort of structural issues and, you know, sort of racism being almost ingrained in, in a lot of the policies and, um, you know, the operations side of, of many historical businesses and our politics and, and institutions. And then on the other side of that, then you've got um, people using, you know, that maybe their celebrity platforms to, to, to claim that people are becoming almost too aware and, and people are too cancelable for, I, I don't like that term personally. Um, I think it's just been thrown around um, as and when, uh, when people do something wrong and uh, shockingly there are consequences. Um, uh, but yeah, you, you've got those, those two polarising um, kind of opinions or sides, I guess. Um, has that made it, I suppose, from a, from a marketing perspective and from a communications perspective, has it made it, I don't want to say the word easier, but has it kind of opened the door to, to more conversations and more awareness around race or would you say that um, because then it's, it's almost there's this small minority that are claiming this kind of, you know, we, we've gone to uh, to left or, or whatever, you know, the term they want to use. Has it made it more challenging for you to get that message out there and have the, the impact that you want it to have? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of both, actually. So as you, I think, yeah. And here to just there, there's, there's the two sides. And I think on the one side, we have now a space where people, um, as I said previously, who are not necessarily impacted by racial discrimination themselves personally, um, are suddenly really tuned into to race and the matters on, on racial justice and actually are really, um, yeah, they're, they're really engaged on it. And that has massively opened our platform in terms of our kind of audience base and how receptive people are to our work and actually the interest with which people read our work. Whereas we might place an op-ed in The Guardian, you know, 10 years ago, some people would have read it with interest. But I think now that race is such a, as you said, debated conversation, but also a conversation that many people want to see something happen on. We, yeah, we have massively gained a huge audience. Um, I think with our Instagram, this was before I joined Renny Mead, but when Black Lives Matter in, in 2020 was kind of really coming to the to the rise. Um, I think we had we went from like 600 followers to like 12,000 followers overnight or something like that on Instagram. So it kind of gives you an understanding of actually how much people want to be informed, which really is important for running me because our core purpose is to provide educational resources. And that's, I think, the stage at which most people are at in terms of actually wanting to know the facts um, with which to tackle racial injustice. Uh, the flip side to that, as you said, is that there is this kind of quarter which are unfortunately very loud um, so I don't actually think that they represent a huge number of people but they have a lot of influence they have a loud voice um, and they do come for us quite a lot um, so we have to be really careful when we put anything out that we are kind of considering that and also just making sure that we're not making mistakes um, which could be yeah just like people cling on to stuff and, and use that um, so we do have you know, to really think about the messaging that we use, the, the content that we're putting out, make sure that we've kind of vetted it and thought it through on our side. Um, but we're definitely not afraid to say the things that we're saying or, um, you know, altering what we're saying because of those people. It's just making sure that we're kind of future-proofing um, our organization in that sense and our messaging in that sense.